Hello, thank you. Thank you in advance for your attention. As a kid, I was horrified when my country went to war with Iraq in 2003. But I was also horrified about the mainstream media coverage we saw. I didn't see the horror of war that I knew instinctively existed. I was deeply affected by the injustice I felt, as I know many others were. Particularly since the US-led coalition invasion of Iraq in 2003, the mainstream media is less and less trusted, and for very good reason, and no less by me. The mainstream media often presents to us a cozy worldview. It often abrogates us individuals of our shared moral responsibilities. When we turn on the news, we are so often presented with what famously British playwright Harold Pinter famously called a vast tapestry of lies upon which we feed. Put alternatively, when we turn on the news, we're often presented with an image of reality that is lacking in depth, clarity, and humanity. Deeply affected myself by the injustice that I knew existed in Palestine, I visited the West Bank and Israel in January 2010, and I was deeply changed and affected by the injustice I saw. I wanted to, for myself, smash up the image of the Israel-Palestine conflict and see the reality with my own eyes. I went from being a media critic in my teenage years to now being a media maker in my early 20s. My attitude has been that if we can make alternative news content outside of the mainstream, and we should do it, which we definitely should, then I may as well try, I may as well try and do my share and get on with it now. For me, journalists should have passion Newsmakers should be passionate for international law, human rights, justice, equality, and peace. I mean, as you know, uh, in the mainstream, it's not easy to find passionate journalists. But I would challenge you not to disagree with me on the following. Journalists should be biased for human rights. I also believe that journalists should have a moral sensibility. Journalists should embody justice-seeking and challenge. Journalists should uh, seek to highlight and exceptionalize human suffering and injustice. After all, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu told us famously, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. I first went to the Gaza Strip of Palestine uh, in May last year, May 2012. And again, I was deeply impacted by the injustice that I saw there visited upon the Palestinians. Since last summer, on and off, I've worked intensively as a people's correspondent, a, a foreign correspondent there, as an independent primarily documentary filmmaker, making powerful documentaries, seeking to wake people up to the reality of the situation in Gaza. For me, I'm trying to touch people's minds and their hearts to the suffering inflicted on the Palestinians in Gaza, suffering which Western states are largely responsible for, and therefore we are largely responsible for. I've come to care deeply about the situation in Gaza, and for me, my work has become something more of a feeling of duty than a kind of job. I often get uh, you know, messages on Facebook and email from young uh, journalists or, or media students wanting to do the kind of work that I do in Gaza or elsewhere. And one very important responsibility for me to communicate to them is that there's nothing stopping them from getting started, just like there was nothing stopping me from getting started or going to Gaza. And so earlier this year, 
uh, I took a convoy to Gaza, a convoy of media agents in July. Media students, media professionals, citizen journalists, and some newbies. And at, at times, it was a kind of uh, boot camp experience as we all tried to focus on making the news that we saw wasn't being in the main, made in the mainstream. And I want to share with you a really uh, fundamental and critical insight from this experience. When you see a raw news making process like that, you start to see all of the, the basic mechanisms that go into making news content, like selection. I should have said subjective selection. On the convoy, it was dubbed the Welcome to Gaza convoy, we had 24 participants from all over the world, from diverse backgrounds and viewpoints. They all cared about the situation in Gaza, though. What we saw was that, for example, uh, people wanted to cover the horror inflicted on Gaza in different ways. Among those writing articles, some wanted to focus on Israel's international legal breaches, focus on specific breaches and using the language of law. Others wanted to focus really mainly on human interest stories, free of any law speak. But the point was that when you're writing an article, you have to choose which facts are included, right? Subjectively. When you're editing a video, you have to include, you have to, excuse me, you have to do, uh, make a decision about which viewpoints, which characters are included. You have to make that decision subjectively. And the point here is that the whole news-making process is actually entirely subjective. And we're often told by supposedly serious news organizations about their commitment to impartiality, objectivity, neutral journalism, and unbiasedness. And one of the things I want to communicate to you today is that's an absolute myth. It's a marketing illusion. The whole thing is one very subjective process. When I took the decision to go to Gaza last year, it was a very big decision. Not because Gaza is a scary war zone with Islamists, terrorists, but because to go to Gaza, unless you are a aid worker, diplomat, or commercial journalist, which I'm not, you have to go into Gaza via Egypt. There's also an Israeli crossing, but that's reserved for the diplomats and etc. So to go via Egypt comes with quite a significant consequence. If you go into Gaza via Egypt, the Israeli state's authority and control is circumvented, and it doesn't like that very much. And so it becomes quite a threat that if you go to Gaza via Egypt, you may not be able to ever go to Israel again. A friend of mine was banned from going to Israel for 10 years for no other discernible reason than he went to Gaza for a couple of weeks to make videos. That's pretty shocking. So for me, I had to decide, do I want to focus my coverage in the near future on the Gaza Strip or on the West Bank and Israel? As you can tell, I chose the Gaza Strip. I hope you see the point I'm trying to, to make here. Journalists not have to, don't have to just choose which facts to include, which viewpoints to include. They crucially even have to decide which stories to even cover. Their agenda is also subjective. Just think for a second, when, you, when you've seen a mind-numbingly boring news story on TV, like Miley Cyrus's twerking, <laughs> just remember, just think, that the inclusion of that story was subjectively decided by an editor at the exclusion of another feature story on serious humanitarian and refugee crises or on Gaza's current acute fuel and resource shortage. In November 2012, after months of bouts of violence between Palestinian militant groups and the Israel, Israel's powerful and modern military, Israel launched an operation on Gaza called Operation Pillar of Cloud, later rebranded Operation Pillar of Defense. It was an open war. 
It was announced via Twitter, and I'd arrived in Gaza just a few days before it was announced. As you can imagine, I felt it was my elementary responsibility to report the reality of the war as events unfolded with as much human impact as possible. As a documentary filmmaker, normally I'm working in the field of making a video report about a particular attack or incident. Obviously, as bombs rained down in all districts of Gaza, I couldn't do that. I had to set up a kind of live feed to keep the news going. So I went back to my apartment and fairly instantaneously set up a Ustream channel. By the end of the war, it had been watched by almost half a million people. I presented English language live breaking news, which I was collecting from various sources around the Gaza Strip, SMS, calls, Viber, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. That's how I was getting my information. And I was presenting it to people on the live feed throughout the bloody eight day war. When I wasn't doing this live stream with my microphone and webcam on my laptop in my flat, I was asleep, which wasn't a lot of the time. But while I was asleep, I set up a microphone uh, on the balcony of my flat so people could listen to the reality, excuse me, of the horror of war on Gaza. I wanted to wake people up to the reality. And that's what you're listening to now. You're listening to a clip from the very late night of November, November 20th, 2012. You're hearing drones. This is what it's like to live in a war zone, people. Wake up to this. That's a fighter jet. An Israeli fighter jet dropped a payload the closest it had done to my apartment during the whole eight-day war, and it cut off the electricity to my apartment building and broke off the live stream. For a while, those on the social media thought I might have been killed. Obviously not, but I had been shaken from my bed and woke up. After the war, I was waiting for a taxi uh, in Gaza City in a street. And I was standing next to a Palestinian woman who was also waiting for the taxi. And she said to me, are you the guy that did the live stream? I said, yes. She said, are you the guy that did the naming of the dead? I said, yes. And from what followed, I could tell that the naming of the dead really meant something to her. So during the war, periodically, I'd read out the names and if the information was available, the ages of Gaza's dead. For me, this was an elementary thing to do. Uh, it was something kind of basic and automatic. And with the, the whole live stream, but also with the naming of the dead specifically, I just trying to humanize the horror for people so they could communicate with the reality of what was being inflicted on Gaza. After the war, I got more broad feedback, incredible feedback from across the world from those who had been listening to the live stream. Those as young as nine years old, all the way up to those in their 80s had been listening to it from all continents and all countries around the world. What I realized is that the live stream meant something to people and that people cared about what was going on, going on in Gaza. It kind of woke them up a bit. I remember when I was in Amsterdam giving a talk about my experience of war reporting, a woman came up to me and very emotionally and very passionately said that the live stream insight into the horror inflicted on Gaza changed her life. Obviously, that meant a lot to me. She said that it changed the way that she saw the Israel-Palestine conflict, the way that she saw the war that I was reporting in comparison to the mainstream, and how she saw her shared moral responsibility in making the war stop. And I realized that the live stream achieved very potently what I set out to do in going to Gaza last summer and making those video reports. Very potently, it connected people with the horror of the reality and what is inflicted on Gaza. People were woken up by that. And as I said, people cared. And crucially, and the reason why I'm telling you this, is because I think that we should applaud the people that watch the live stream for their courage. They were courageous enough to go outside of the cozy bubble presented to us by the mainstream media. That bubble of reality that gives us an, an, an easy ride and doesn't challenge us.
we're all human. Journalists, by the way, just in case you didn't know, are also human. And we're all subject to our own sense of subjectivity. For journalists, this also goes to govern the way they work and how they see the world. But all of us as humans, our perception, our subjectivity governs how we see the world, our role in it, our perception of our private responsibilities in the world, our perception of our shared responsibilities in the acts of others. But crucially, it also goes to govern our potential sense of seeing superiority or inferiority in ourselves. And also, again, crucially, our ability to dehumanize the other. Now, that might be the Muslim other, the Arab other, or the Palestinian other. Journalists should have a moral sensibility. We, as citizens, and I hope this starts with you today here at TEDx Copenhagen in 2013, we as citizens need to wake up and we need to expect and demand more from journalists, newsmakers, and news organizations. We need to expect and demand more upfrontness and openness about the stands these journalists will take and the agendas that they're serving. Secondly, we need to support the independent journalists across the world who work courageously outside of the mainstream to present us with an often more hard-hitting, realistic, and an honest image of the world. Those journalists from Iraq to Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, North America, South America, the West Bank, Israel, Gaza, and elsewhere, they need our support. But most crucially, and most fundamentally, we have to be willing to actually confront reality and not hide behind the cozy worldview presented to us by the mainstream media. When we smash the illusory mirror and look through the frame, we will see the real image of the world and our role in it. And that image might shock us, but it is our obligation to go after it. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.